faces, and I'm telling you what, it's exciting, amen, it's an exciting time, we're getting close to our uh, October 17th, that's this Saturday, amen, it's, it's just about here, I'm telling you what, it, we announced it so long ago, but now it seems like it's right upon us, and so I'm excited, I know personally of eight different families that are going to be there on Saturday uh, through some of our outreach and through our ability to, to go out and visit and some of those different things, and so we're very encouraged by that, and again, we'll, we'll hit it hard here in the next couple of days as we... Uh, zero in on it, amen, as we continue to invite and do some of those different things. So again, I, I pray that you're doing the same, and I pray that uh, you are uh, <coughs> gathering those families that, that you know need to be there, and if you need some other invitations or anything like that, make sure you let us know. We've got some out there on the welcome desk, but we sure would print off any that you'd need, and uh, we'd be happy to do that, as well as I know that the ad has been placed in Mount Orb. It was placed on their TV station, amen, so it's, it's even over there, and so I'm praying that we'll have a, a great a great outreach from that day. And again, you can't invite the wrong person. Amen. We, we've said that so many times, but uh, there's not the wrong person to invite. You invite anybody and we'll give them the gospel. And uh, we're, we're praying that we'll see souls saved. Amen. So that's our goal for that day. And that's our target. And so again, that is this Saturday. Make sure that you are uh, well informed about that and make sure that you bring your family. We'd love to see them here. Okay. Next up is uh, our ladies on November the 7th. You've got a tea party here at the church. Uh, beginning at noon. The cost is $15 a person. Uh, those invitations are being passed out. That, that's to every lady. Don't think that that's exclusive at all. Every time we see a lady, we give them an invitation. If you know anybody that's been missed, make sure that we know about them. We'll personally get them one. Uh, but we want to make sure that all the ladies have received an invitation for that. And uh, there is an RSVP inside of that. So please make sure you let us know if you're going to be there just so we can plan accordingly. And uh, I know that that's kind of where we are on that, as well as an announcement I've not made yet because we've had some uh, scheduling issues and we finally got them worked out. My ordination service is going to be on the 24th of October, okay? So that's in two Saturdays, not this Saturday, but the next Saturday. It'll be here at the church on Saturday and it'll be at 4 p.m., okay? So 4 p.m. And, and you'll probably be out of here around 5 or 5.30, somewhere uh, in that time range, uh, maybe a little bit longer than that, but it won't take all night. Uh, but again, that's next, next Saturday, so the 24th, and again, that's 4 p.m. as the start time for that, okay? So I want to put that out there just so you know. And also, on Saturday mornings, our outreach program, uh, we're praying that we could strengthen that outreach program. If you are uh, available on Saturday mornings, please consider coming out and helping us knock doors. Uh, we've had a tremendous opportunity to be able to do this here recently. Uh, we've had a great response from our community. I remember the first day we went out, the first Saturday, we decided to knock doors again. Uh, we were nervous, and we had people thanking us for going out and knocking doors, which is, is just amazing to me for uh, the, the people that have been shut in for so long to be thanking us for doing the Lord's work. And so uh, make sure that you are part of that if you're able to, and, and you can't be the wrong person. And if you can walk and you can talk, and you're the right person. Amen. Jesus will use you. So show up and be a part of that, please. Again, Saturday morning at 9 o'clock, we'll have coffee and donuts there for you, and uh, we would love to see you there at that time. Moving on now to our praises and prayer requests, we'll mute our, our live stream just for your privacy.
All right, if you'll stand with me and take your hymn books and turn it to page 18. Page 18, we're going to sing, Take the Name of Jesus With You. We're going to sing the first, second, and the fourth verse, page 18. stand and uh, tell us who you are and, and, and what you're doing, what the Lord's doing through your life. Would you just do that real quick, please? Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Joshua. My wife's name is Kristen. Uh, Kristen, and uh, we have missionaries to Papua New Guinea. I am originally uh, born and raised in uh, New Guinea, and uh, I got saved under the uh, ministry of John and Mary Gray. Uh, John was from Dayton, Ohio, and after I got saved, I was uh, had the privilege to serve with them for three years. And God gave me the opportunity to come to the state, went to Mary at Bible College, and after six years, uh, uh, graduated training in um, uh, Working with the Sugarland Bay Baptist Church uh, under the leadership of Pastor Owen McGuffey, but uh, my wife and I, we are full time on the vacation and uh, uh, visiting churches around the area, and uh, God is good, and uh, we are happy to be here tonight. Amen. And uh, really uh, privileged to be with your pastor. And, uh, it's a joy to be here tonight. Thank you. Amen. Thank you for coming. We enjoy having you here. And if you've not been around Marietta Bible College, I'm telling you what, what a, a neat and fantastic place. It's wonderful. Uh, the last time I was there, I know I made some friends. And I remember a, a man named Fernando. That was his name. And I cannot remember what country he was to. That, that's just the lack of my brain. But he said he had not seen his wife and kids in three years because he was studying at Marietta Bible College. And, and I'm telling you, friend, we are not even faithful enough to show up to church every service. And these men and women from these countries are, are willing to come and, and they're willing to serve and, and willing to put everything else to the side just for the opportunity to learn about Jesus. And I'm telling you, friend, if you want to be challenged, get around these people because they're amazing. They are, and they've got real, genuine walks with Jesus. That, that's what they've got. And I'm telling you, it's such an encouragement. So, Mary to Bible College, good friend of ours. We love them. Thank you so much for serving and some of those different things. We'll be praying for you on the mission field. Absolutely, brother. First John chapter number one and verse number one. Here we are. I said chapter. There's only one chapter, but here we are in verse number one. The Bible says this, uh, the elder unto the elect lady and her children whom I love uh, in the truth, and not I only, but also they that have not known the truth. For the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us, shall be with us forever. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord uh, Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. In truth and love, I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as ye have, I'm sorry, as we have received a commandment from the Father. 
And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is the love that we walk after his commandments. And this is the commandment, that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. For many deceivers are entered into the world and confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever uh, transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, but hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, and receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is a partaker of his evil deeds. And so, uh, again, here in, in, in the book of Second John, we, we've read a lot, but uh, the Bible is going to go through and it's going to lay out some of these uh, commandments and some of these teachings that these uh, folks have been given. Amen. The, these, these doctrinal things that they've been taught, the things that they've been taught to stand in. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad that I know what I believe. Amen. I'm glad for the things that I've been taught. I'm glad that I had a pastor who knew his Bible. I'm glad that I had a youth pastor that knew his Bible. And I'm glad that they taught me and poured into me and gave me Bible and gave me a foundation and gave me knowledge. And friend, that's what each and every one of us should have, could have, has no excuse not to have, especially because we live here in America, amen, where uh, you can find a Bible just about anywhere. Uh, Amazon, I've heard in some places, delivering now within two hours of you ordering something, which is absolutely amazing. What, what I'm saying is this, that Bibles are everywhere and everybody has a capability of having a Bible. You also notice this, if you live in America, there's about a church on every corner, amen, especially here in Ohio. Now, you go to some different places, you know, in some different states. I know it's a little bit different. Michigan, uh, I studied under Preacher Smith in Michigan. He, he used to pastor my, uh, Mount Orr Bible Baptist, and uh, I studied under him, and, and I was up there. And Michigan's a little bit different, but they've got quite a few churches. But here in Ohio especially, uh, there's churches all over the place, even just here in the Eastgate area. Uh, I don't even know how many churches you have, amen? And so uh, there's no excuse where we live not to have truth, amen? Not to have knowledge, not to have the word of God. There's absolutely no excuse. And then if you want to take it a step further to be in a Bible preaching church, amen? A church that preaches scripture, a church that teaches knowledge and teaches the wisdom of God and that only, amen? Nothing of a man, nothing of... Uh, any other person, but God's wisdom and God's word alone is what we preach. There is no excuse, amen, to be negligent or, or, or to be ignorant of God's word. And so these people, again, as, as they receive these commandments, uh, what he's telling them is as you're receiving these commandments, the purpose for receiving these commandments is that you walk in them. In other words, not that you hear them and go on the same, but that you hear these commandments and then you walk in them according to God's word. And, and I'd no, like you to notice something. In verse number five, it says this, And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is what he says in verse number six, And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. And now this is something, again, that, that we'd like to unsee, right? As sinful people, as fleshly people, this is a verse that uh, we wish we could skip over. Uh, in other words, what I'm saying is there's an entire world of people out there that call themselves Christians, but don't walk after God. In other words, they claim to be Christians. They, they claim to believe in Christ. They claim to have uh, the blood of Jesus, right, that uh, washes away all of their sins. But their life is something completely different from what they're proclaiming that they know about Jesus. And see, the Bible says something about you and me, and it says this, that we need to walk after his commandments. He says, and this is love that you walk after his commandments. In other words, uh, the Bible says it like this also, if you love me, keep my commandments, amen? And so what we understand is if we have a real, genuine love for the Lord Jesus Christ, then we will be concerned with his commandments, not just with the things of the world. Now, does that mean that you and I never sin after we're saved? No, uh, we're not so foolish to believe that we become perfect after we sin. Now, uh, we do know this, we're delivered from sin, amen? We're delivered from the power and the bondage that sin once had over our mortal bodies, uh, but we're still susceptible to sin. We're, we're still fleshly, earthly people. And so we're dying to ourselves each and every day, trying to, uh, the word is sanctify, that means to set ourselves apart, right, from the world. We're trying to sanctify ourselves 
if you want to use the word progressive sanctification, meaning that we become more set apart for the cause of Christ over the course of our life, right? We become more set apart for God the longer that we live. And see, the, the, the opposite is said of, of many Christians, that they're close to God when they get saved, and then the longer they go from the moment that they got saved, the farther away they grow from God. And here's the answer, because that relationship probably wasn't real. That relationship probably, it, it probably wasn't a, a, a real, genuine salvation, because I know this, when I got saved, I became a new creature. Amen? When I got saved, behold, all things passed away and all things become new. Everything that I was passed away, and God made a new creature out of who I was. In other words, it, it wasn't even that I wanted to be good. It's just that something changed inside of me, and I could no longer do bad. I could no longer keep doing bad and feel good about it. Right beforehand, I, I could do whatever I wanted, and, and, and I might have some uh, physical things that, that might say, man, probably should not have done that, but it definitely wasn't the level of conviction that I felt when I got saved, amen, and when I had the Holy Spirit of God living inside of me, now when I do something wrong, or now when I do something against God's word, friend, I don't know how people live in sin, I've got no choice, amen, I feel so guilty and so convicted, and the Holy Spirit works inside of me, I, I gotta get that thing right, and so the Bible says if we're really saved, we will keep his commandments, and again, I feel like I'm, I'm preaching to, you know, the, the, the faithful folks that show up on Wednesday night. Uh, you wouldn't know that we're a very big church if, if you stopped by on a Wednesday night. But on Sunday morning, we look great. Amen. We, we had 70-plus uh, people on Sunday morning. You, you know, that was one of the few Sundays I actually counted just to uh, see what the number was. But you show up on a Wednesday night, you say, man, this is a tiny church. Now, this is a little church, right? Only 10 people in sanctuary or whatever it is. And, but that's what I'm saying is that we live in a world where we'd rather serve all these other things than worship God. Amen? We live in the middle of a culture that would rather live to themselves or live after the world than worship Jesus the way that he intended for us to worship. In other words, we live in a lukewarm age of Christianity. And I think that you see that everywhere. I think that you, you just reach out to the churches around us and I think you see it. I think that you look at the state of the church in general and you see it. That we no longer follow God's word alone, but now we follow God's word and we mix in a couple other things with it, right? It's like the salad. It's not good by itself, so you got to put something else in there with it, right? The dressing and all the, the – I don't eat salad, period, so it's all bad to me. But, you know, you try to dress it up and make it taste better. Listen, friend, God's word is not something we try to dress up and make it taste better, amen? God's, God's church, God's word, it's not dressed up to be something different. It is what it is. And so we're going to follow it. Or we're not going to follow it. And that's the two choices that you and I have. That's what I love about the Word of God. You know, I tell people this all the time. The Word of God brings you to a fork in the road. It brings you to a crossroads. It brings you to a fork. It brings you to a, whatever you want to say. It brings you, in other words, to an intersection where you've got to make a decision. Listen to this. Beforehand, you didn't know any better. But now that you know Jesus, now that you know Scripture, now because of Jesus' charges, commandments, uh, messages, uh, convictions, whatever you want to say, now because of those things, what you've done is you've now come to a point in life where you've got to make a decision based on God's Word. In other words, I say this all the time, you've heard me say it all the time, but you're free to choose, but you're not free not to choose. You're free to choose, you go the way that Jesus wants you to, and you're free to choose it, but you're not free now that you've heard about Jesus not to choose. Now you have to make a choice. And so because of Jesus and your and I's lives, we've got to make a decision where we are if we're going to walk with him or we're not. And here's what we've got to realize, friend. There's no middle ground. Amen? There's no middle ground. There's no gray area in between. There's no, I keep God's commandments. I'm a good Christian, but I also, there's nothing in between. You know, the more I door knock, the more I hear things like this. In other words, the more I get around the world, the more I hear relationships and stories just like this. Oh, well, I'm a Christian. I go to church, but, but I've got my sins just like everybody else does, right? And, and we accept those sins rather than dig them out and push them away from us and get our relationship right with the Lord. He says this, and this is love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that, you, uh, that as you've heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. And then it says this in verse number seven, for many are deceivers, I'm sorry, for many deceivers are entered in the world who confess not that Jesus has come in the flesh, 
this is a deceiver and an antichrist. So, in other words, what we understand is uh, this is the commandment that you love the Lord and walk in his commandments. And anything else outside of that, we understand, is a perversion of God's word. In other words, any other religion or any other sect of Christianity or any other uh, whatever you want to say, church or denomination or, or what, whatever you want to say, Anybody else that it says anything else but God's word alone is a perversion of what God's word was originally intended to be. And then it says this, anybody who comes and preaches not Jesus, that he has come in the flesh, anybody that preaches anything else besides Jesus, it says a deceiver. It says there's, there's many deceivers coming to the world. And if they're not preaching Jesus, then it says this, they're an antichrist. Uh, they're, they're literally the opposite of what Christ would have wanted them to. To be Now listen to this, how many people do you know that claim to be Christians that don't even talk about Jesus? I'm telling you this, I've heard sermons that didn't even mention Jesus. And I'm telling you what, I don't know why we're here. If Jesus isn't the main point, amen? The word of God, Jesus is the main point. You can walk through every book in the Bible, you'll find Jesus. You can, you can, mark my word, I'm telling you, you can walk through, you can see Jesus in every book of the Bible. And so listen to this, friend, if, the, if Jesus is the main point of the Bible, why is he not the main point of our worship? Why is he not the main point of our church? Why is he not the main point of our outreach? Why is he not the main point of our, our functions and what we're doing as a church? And see, as a whole, what I think we've done is, again, we, we've accepted this lukewarm doctrine that you can come to church and be a dedicated Christian, but you can also have your toes in the world's pool, right? You can dip your feet in both ponds, but the Bible says that's not so. We either follow his word or we don't follow his word. So we've got to keep his commandments, and anything else outside of that, we've got to understand is deception. We've got to understand is something that is a perversion of what God intended his church to be. Now, that's hard to do. Why is that hard to do? Because I know good people on both sides. Amen? I know good people that say they're Christians and, and, and don't act it out. And I know good people that are hardcore Christians. And, and, and man, they, they do it right. They keep his commandments. And I know good people on both sides. But I don't have to pick because they're good or bad. I just know God's word. Amen? And that's what the world doesn't understand. You know, I've had people tell me I'm a part of a cult because I go to a church that meets three times a week. I've had people tell me that. I've had people look me in the face and say, your church is a cult because on Thanksgiving they have a dinner and expect you to go to the church's Thanksgiving dinner instead of your family Thanksgiving dinner. I've had people say that to me. I've had people look me dead in the face and say that my church is a cult because of how dedicated we are to Jesus. Hey, let me tell you what that told me. My church is doing something right. Amen? Amen. If my church is offensive to the world, if my church is something that the world stumbles on because of my dedication to Jesus, something's right. Amen? But if the world comes because they don't feel convicted, if the world comes because they feel like they fit in, and the world comes because they feel like uh, they're just one of the crowd, guess what? Something's wrong with that church. Something's wrong with that church. If they walk in and, and as an unsaved person, they can fit right in. They can blend right in. They, they're not being preached to. Sin's not being convicted. Things aren't being preached. Now, I said this the other day because I had somebody mad at me. Hey, listen, I wish I didn't have to preach on sin either. Yeah, man, wouldn't it be so easy if we could all just get together and uh, preach happiness and love and all these different things? But I'll remind you this. The Bible talks about hell more than it does heaven. Amen. Yeah, the Bible talks about hell more than it does heaven. You know what? The Bible talks about sin. And we've got to talk about sin. We've got to talk about the way that our lives ought to be. We've got to talk about what God requires of us because we've been saved. Which brings me to my next point is this, that we've been purchased with a price. Do you realize that? We've been purchased with a price. What does that mean? In other words, salvation is free to us. Amen. All we've got to do is receive it. That, that's one of the fundamental Building blocks to who we are as Bible Baptist, Bible believing uh, Baptist. That, that's just the fundamental building block to who we are. The salvation is free. But I'll tell you this, friend nothing is ever free because somebody had to pay for that salvation. In other words, somebody paid a big price. It's not me, it's free for me, but somebody paid a big price. Jesus paid it all. Amen. He died on the cross. His blood was shed for us. He sweat uh, uh, drops of blood in the garden of Gethsemane, right? He, he went through all these things that you and I could simply be saved 
And then what do we invest back into the life that God's given to us? What do we give back because of the blood of Jesus? What do we put back into this world because of Jesus in my life? And this is one of the biggest plagues of the church, I believe, is that we accept Jesus and then we think that we're here to be entertained. We think that the church should have lazy boys and recliners and we should sit back and be entertained and the stage should go and the show should go and everything should go the way I like it. And if not, I'm going to leave that church. Well, listen up, friend. It's not about us. Amen. It's not about being entertained. It's about giving back to God. It's about my life being lived for him because he gave his life for me. Life is not about being entertained. Life is not about having fun. Life is not about all the different things the world makes it. It's about our dedication to Jesus Christ. Hey, listen to this. It's about keeping his commandments. How important is that in a world today that doesn't keep any commandments? How important is that in a world that has completely gotten rid of standards and morals and all kinds of... It is important that you and I keep his commandments. It is uh, imperative. That's a good word. It's imperative that you and I keep God's commandments, especially in the middle of a world that is watching us. In the middle of a world that is watching the moves, is watching the motives, is watching the the reasons for why we do the things that we do. It's imperative that you and I keep his commandments to show this world Jesus really does make a difference, amen? He really does make a difference. I don't know how many of my Facebook friends are from my high school, but I can guarantee you this is probably not many of them. And here's why, because I know this, when I got saved when I was in high school, all my friends left me. I got saved, I was real popular before I got saved. I didn't have a lick of a friend. I, I'm telling you, I did not have any friends. I ate in the library alone while I read books. I read books and I read my Bible during, because I did not have a, a friend that would sit with me. I don't know how many of those people on my Facebook page are actually my friends that, that were with me in high school. And if they are my friends, They probably don't follow my feed because it's a bunch of messages and different things. Here's what I'm saying. My life changed. Amen. Amen. Something was different about me because of Jesus Christ in my life. And it's imperative that the world see that of us. It's imperative that when somebody looks you up or finds you or talks to you for the first time in forever, that they see Jesus in your life. Isn't that our goal? Isn't that our testimony? Isn't that what we strive for each and every day? I want people to see Jesus in my life. It says this in verse number seven, for many deceivers are entered in the world who confess not that Jesus has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. And it says this, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He, uh, he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son, if there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. And now the Bible is going to introduce again a, a new principle to us, and that's not only that you and I should have our lives right and keep his commandments, but now we need to watch what we're supporting with our lives. In other words, the Bible says if somebody comes preaching something else besides Jesus, you say, okay, that guy's a little out there, but... Let's just send him on his way. Let, let's just help him go so he can get out of here and get away from us. The Bible's saying now you're guilty of the same thing for supporting that person from going out and preaching anything else besides Jesus. Amen. Uh, you know, we've got missionaries here with us tonight. I was just at a, a big preacher's meeting in Canton, Ohio. And you know what? It's very important. We know what those missionaries believe, isn't it? It's very important. It's very important. They have the foundation right and they've got all those things laid out that when they get out on the field, they're preaching. Jesus, some of these people are countries away. They're, they're, they're thousands and thousands of miles away. We've got to know that they've got these right things. And here's what Brother Gary Gray said. He's a preacher, and he's looking down at this, this whole crowd of, of missionaries. All these. What, what happens is at these preachers' meetings, missionaries will go, and they'll be there, and they'll present their ministries in front of all these. It's a great way to network. It really is. It's wonderful. I'm not condemning it at all. It's a wonderful thing that we do. And again, they get to present their ministries, but... He's an older guy. He's real seasoned. He's retired from his church now. And, and I'm telling you what, when, when people start to get a little seasoned and start to get a little older, they kind of get away with things that other people can't. And he looked at this whole section of missionaries, and he said, every single one of you is starving to get inside of these churches. He goes, make sure you deserve it. 
Make sure you deserve it. In other words, don't just beg for the bone, but make sure you're really going to do the work. That's what he said to a whole group of missionaries in front of all these pastors and preachers. What he's saying is, we're not going to waste our time sending you if Jesus is not the main point. Amen? And for us in our lives, our main goal is Jesus Christ. And so we're not going to support anything else that's not Jesus Christ. And that's what our lives should be. That, that should be the outlook for our lives as we're looking to the different things that we're giving our lives to. Uh, by the way, that, that's why I think that we separate ourselves from some of these different things. Uh, you know, right now, the uh, sports teams are being turkey butts with all their uh, propaganda and all the stuff that they're pushing. Uh, and you know what? Half America stopped watching. I love that. The, the world says, oh, we're so liberal and we're so far gone and we're so sinful. Half the world stopped watching those guys. You know what that tells me? There's a lot more conservative people out there that aren't making a whole big fuss like the, well, I'll get off that rabbit trail, but I think that there's a lot more people out there that really do respect what Jesus says. Listen, we, we don't need to give ourselves to those things. Our lives need to be separate, not given to all this big mess, not given to anything else that preaches anything besides Jesus Christ. Because what happens is when those things become a part of our lives, what you'll notice is they start to indoctrinate us. It doesn't matter how strong you are. doesn't matter who you are. doesn't matter if you've done this thing forever or allowed this thing to be in your life forever. You will be indoctrinated by the things that you are allowing to be a part of your life. And the teenagers ask me all the time, why can't I listen to secular music? Why, why is that such a big deal about church? Why can I not listen to secular music? And I tell them all the time, it's not because the music is anything other than it's because of the messages. That the music communicates. It's not the beats, it's not the rhythm, it's not, it's the messages. And if these kids would listen to the messages, they'd wake up and realize what these songs are saying. You know, I noticed this. When I was young and little, I could listen to songs and, and I could be ignorant and I could be whatever, and, and I didn't know a word of what they said. But when I listen to those songs now, it's like those TV shows you used to watch when you were a kid, the cartoons, uh, SpongeBob. We watched Spongebob when I was little. We weren't, my family wasn't saved. We never thought anything about Spongebob. I watch Spongebob now. I turn on an episode for old time's sake. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is awful. This is the worst cartoon I've ever seen. It's terrible because of all the different things that were written for adults that slips right over top of kids' heads. The same thing is true with the music. The same thing is true with all the different things that they're buying into is they've all got messages. They've all got propaganda. They've all got these agendas they're pushing and we cannot be a part of them. We'll be indoctrinated by the things that are in our lives. In other words, the things that are pouring into us, we'll be indoctrinated by them. Uh, you know, these, these video games and different things, we, we've got to watch what comes in because it'll re directly reflect what goes out. Amen? What comes in directly reflects with what comes out. And I'm telling you, friend, if you're taking in negative, if you're taking in bad, you're taking in sin and all these different things, it's going to affect what comes out. You'll start to see less fruit. You'll start to see less coming from your life. You'll start to see less people saved. You'll start to see less effect and, and less peace and uh, long-suffering and joy and all the fruits of the Spirit that God tells us that should be coming from. You'll see less of it every time you will. I'm telling you. You'll see less of it. Why? Because you're being indoctrinated by the things that come in. And I think as a people, as God's people, we need to realize I don't need to be indoctrinated by the world. I can lose the world, amen? If the sports teams want to be turkey butts, I can lose the sports. Sports aren't essential to life. But you know what is essential? God's word is essential, amen? And so I've got to protect that relationship that I have with the Lord. I've got to protect uh, that thing that I've got. I've got to get everything else out because God is the main point. And here's what he says. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is a partaker of his evil deeds. And it says this, having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full and the children of thy elect sister greet thee. Amen. And again, what a, a, a wonderful letter that was written. What a, a wonderful book that you and I can read. But again, just the reminder to you and me of what we need to do with these mortal bodies because this life is not about us and what we can build. It's all about what we can give back to the Lord. And what I've been working on with a few guys lately is studying what we know, studying what we believe, I should say, studying what we believe. Uh, because, again, we'll come to church and we'll sit and we'll listen and all these different things. But uh, you'd be surprised by how many Christians don't even know what we believe is, is a Baptist church. Uh, you'd be shocked by how many people just don't know their Bible. 
they come to church and they do all these different things, but, but, but they just don't know their Bible. And here's what I'd encourage you, friend. You don't have to wait for the preacher to say it. You can know it. You can read your Bible and you can know it. And that's one of my favorite things about being in a Baptist church, not a Catholic church. Amen? You ever gone to a Catholic church? Uh, it's not your Bible. They read the Bible. They tell you what it is. You don't have one. They tell you. And, and it was written in a different language and all those different things. So, so you were getting it from somebody else. Listen, my favorite thing about us is you've got it right there. And you've got the same Bible. You've got the same relationship with God that I do. And so, again, you can study these things out. You can grow in your relationship uh, the same way that I can. And so every man needs to be taking forward those steps. And here's what happens when you keep his commandments. When you keep his commandments, we see growth in who we are. So what happens when you keep his commandments? You and I will see growth in our lives. We'll see next steps being taken. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that come up to me and brag about a lot of things that they do. Amen? Well, I think that's just because we're people. And I do this, and I've done this, and I've done that in my life, and I used to do this, and I served here, and I did this. And But if I look at your life and I don't see fruit in it, friend, those are just words. Amen? They're just words. You can brag. I can brag. And I'll point my fingers back at myself. I can brag and say, man, we had 70 people at church, and all these days, I mean, we can do all this bragging. But I'm telling you what, friend, if there's no fruit coming, it's all just words. If there's no next steps being taken, if there's no... Uh, uh, advancements in your life, friend, those are just words. And we've got to keep his commandments that that, that, that makes and uh, brings about a relationship with him that's always moving forward. You know, we talked about just a second ago, and I, I knew we were going to come back to it, that sanctification, that being set apart. Not that you'd move the other way, not that you'd get saved and move farther away from God, but that you'd get saved and for the rest of your life you'd be more set apart for the cause of Christ. Now imagine that. Imagine from the moment you got saved for the rest of your life, you became more set apart for the cause of Jesus Christ. Imagine that. Now here's why we can't imagine it, because some of us are the exact same as when we got saved. Some of us, we were on fire for a short time, but for who knows how long, for years and years and years, we've sat and we've been the exact same that we were all those years ago. One of my favorite things I used to do as a kid is we would do self-reflection sheets. It sounds really silly, right? You, you say, why would you like that as a kid? Well, because I was saved and because I really did want my relationship with the Lord to change. I wanted it to grow. And we would, we would have these sheets that had numbers on them. And what those numbers would be is, uh, hey, my Bible reading was a one this year. I was really bad. And next year I want it to be a five. Or it was a five this year. Next year I want it to be a seven. Or what, it was just reflections, numbers that we could look back on. And I can remember this. The charge was that each and every year those numbers would get better. Amen? That they would not stay the same. Surely that they wouldn't get worse. Nobody wanted their numbers to get worse, but you didn't want your numbers to stay the same. In other words, if I was a five this year, I wanted to be a six next year on my Bible reading. or uh, With my prayer life, I, I was a three this year, and I wanted to be a six, and I didn't want to have the same numbers. In other words, what it taught me to do is to always be moving forward. Always be progressing in my relationship with the Lord. Always be becoming more set apart for his cause. And what it's allowed me to do is grow. And what I think we've got to get out of the habit of as churches is complacency. Amen? We've got to get out of that habit. We've got to get away to that, from that mindset that I can sit and be the same and it doesn't affect anybody around me. I can sit and be the same person. It doesn't affect anybody else. Listen, friend. You need to grow, and it affects this church how you grow. Amen? It does. Uh, I truly believe this. In our, our junior church and our teenagers, and this isn't the only people that are here tonight. We've got a group of about 20 teenagers, and we've got kids in the back, and nearly 10 of them now. Uh, I believe that God is raising up the next generation of Christians right now. Uh, we might have the next preacher back in junior church right now. Uh, we might have the, the next evangelist over there in the teen group, the next missionary. the next. They might be here right now. But you know what, friend? If we're not taking the next steps, nobody's over there teaching them. If nobody would have stepped up and taken that next step to teach a teen class, there'd be nobody teaching. If nobody steps up and becomes and does and allows the Lord to move, guess what, friend? There's no future ministries. And I'll tell you this, we need some future ministries, amen? We need it. Now, we're going to get to the point here soon on Sunday mornings where we need individual classes for these kids. We're going to need a first grade class and a second grade class or a first and second and third and fourth, whatever it is, but we're going to need to divide those up. And guess what, folks? Well, we need some more people that can serve. What does that mean? That we need some new people to take some new steps. Because God's church can't just be the same that it always has been. It's got to grow. 
It's got to be built. It's got to continue to go, not to die out. And isn't that the saddest thing in the world when you see a church that used to be great slowly die? You see a work that used to be so fruitful and used to have so many souls saved, and over the years you've just seen it die. We don't want to see God's work die. We don't want to see God's work fade. We want to see this thing become strong. Amen. We want to build this thing up. And so how does that happen? We've got to take the next steps in our lives. And I'll tell you this about next steps. It goes right along with keeping his commandments. It's never easy. Next steps are never easy. In fact, most of the time they put you in a vulnerable position. Vulnerable position. Most of the time they do. Most of the time they put you in a position you're not comfortable. Most of the time they put you in a position where you're going to have to make a fool of yourself or you're going to have to do something or maybe something wrong can happen. I tell the story of when I, I gave my first devotion. Remember that story? I gave my first devotion and my preacher, Jeremy Stout, if you know him, he's, he's not a very organized person at all. Uh, it's just him, but it works. It works great for him. Uh, somehow, some way, he gave me a card about this size and it had four or five verses written on it and that was it. One of the verses I couldn't even read because it was so quickly written. And I'm like, that's not a devotion. I don't know what that is. And he said, no, you're going to preach it. You're going to be fine. Go and, and, and preach this in this nursing home. And so I showed up to this nursing home. I'd never given a devotion before. I've never publicly uh, uh, spoken. I've never done anything like that. And here I've got a card with five verses on it. And I show up. I literally read the verses, prayed, and left. It was probably, I'm not even joking, it was probably a three-minute devotion, and I was gone and out of there before those old people even realized what was happening. And it was awful. It was horrible. I'm telling you, it was the worst thing that I've ever done. But you know what? It leapfrogged my faith into progressing and taking next steps. And then I was preaching in a team room, and then I was going out and witnessing in public. And then I was speaking, and then I was preaching. Who in the world knows how that happened? How God allowed me to preach. I was preaching in front of my church, and, and then I was on staff at a church called Hillsboro, and they've got hundreds of people, and I'm preaching in front of hundreds. And what in the world happened? And now God allows me to pastor? I'm telling you, it's amazing when we'll just take next steps, what God will do through our lives. But here's the problem. We've got to take those steps. See, life would be so easy if Jesus would just take us. Wouldn't it be so easy? Wouldn't it be so easy if that car drove itself? And you got in, got saved, and Jesus just took you the rest of the way? Listen, friend, but it's not so. Now, Jesus will take you the rest of the way, but you've got to allow him to do it. And you've got to take a series of uncomfortable steps. You've got to take a series of uh, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe not the most comfortable position, but you've got to continue to take those steps, getting to where God wants you to be. For your life. And here's the here's the best thing about it. I don't think any of us have arrived. Amen. I don't think any of us have. Now, you talk to a, a room full of preachers that have been preachers for, for years. They've not arrived. God is still taking them. And friend, you'll know you arrived when you meet the Lord in heaven. Amen. That's when you'll know you arrived. But until then, you've not arrived. And so each and every one of us has a next step that we need to take. And so whatever that is, friend, for you tonight, I don't know. And I don't know what the Lord is, is speaking to you in your life about. I don't know what God wants you to do next. But I do know this. God wants us to keep his commandments. And God wants us to take those next steps. And so I don't care how far along in life you are. I don't care where you are in life. I don't care how settled in or how founded you are. And you can take a next step. Amen. There's something that the Lord can push you in. There's something that you can do that the Lord would have you to do. There's something that you can serve in. That God was saying, man, you can do that. And again, I just love that story about that preacher with his mom. And, and, and she had a polio. Remember that story? And she made a difference. She made a big difference. Somebody who couldn't do anything and gave their heart to the Lord. And guess what? God made a big difference. And that's what we are. And that's what we can do if we'll just dedicate our lives to the Lord. So with every head bowed and every closed, let's stand and we'll pray. And again, I pray that you're praying for those next steps in your life. And praying that you'll seek what God has for you. Lord, we love you tonight and need you. So grateful for you again, Lord, and all that you've done. Lord, in my life, I know I need a next step. Lord, I know that I've got many steps to take, Lord, and, and I know that I'll never arrive. And so, Lord, I pray that you continue, Lord, to push me, and I pray, God, that you continue to move me in my life, Lord, that I continue to keep taking steps. And God, I don't ever want to become complacent. Lord, I don't ever want to come to a place in life where I've stopped obeying your commands. I've stopped obeying what you'd have for me. And I'm serving my Lord. I never want to get to that place. I always want to be serving you. And so, God, in, in your words, in 1 John chapter number 2, or I'm sorry, in 2 John, in, in, in 
those verses that we read today, Lord, you, you talk about keeping your commandments. You talk about, Lord, that that is love. And anything outside of that, Lord, is something else than the faith, than the walk, than the dedication that you have required me to have with you. And Lord, I don't want to have a perversion of what my relationship should be with you. I want to have the real thing. And so, Lord, tonight as a group of believers, as a church, Lord, that I believe wants to seek your heart, and I believe wants to progress the next steps. God, I pray that you do the work in our hearts. God, I pray that you confirm in our hearts, Lord, that you are always worth it. God, and I pray that you give us your faith, Lord, that we'd be able to make it through whatever would come in life that would stop us from taking those steps. But Lord, today and right now, we need to keep your commandments. And today and right now, we need to stand strong in your word. And so, God, I pray that you'd allow your church to do just that. I pray that you'd allow us to stand strong in your word. And God, I pray that you'd allow us to be a propagator of your gospel and your word. And I pray that you'd use Victory Baptist Church. So we love you tonight, Lord Jesus, and we need you. And God, we ask that you have your will and your way with our lives. It's in Jesus Christ's holy and precious name we pray. And with every head bowed, every eye closed, you might be seasoned in years and you might have experienced many things with the Lord. But the Lord is asking you of a next step. The Lord is asking you to go somewhere else. Listen, friend, keep his commandments. Keep his word. Keep that walk moving forward, not going backwards. Maybe, friend, tonight you've been challenged because you're not keeping his commandments. You've been allowing other things into life. You've been allowing other things to take your time and your mind and your efforts. Tonight, you simply need to refocus back on Jesus and keeping his commandments and his commandments alone. Listen, friend, wherever you're at tonight or whatever you're dealing with, would you do this? Would you allow the Lord to deal with your heart? Would you allow the Lord to do that work in your life? Here's what I'm going to do, and here's what I invite you to do. I'm going to bow, I'm going to pray, because I know that there are next steps God wants me to take. I know that there are areas of my life where I need to go stronger. And so I'm going to bow and I'm going to pray. Here's what I'm going to invite you to do. I'm going to invite you to come as I pray. If you need somebody to pray with, grab someone. They'll come with you. If you need somebody up here at the altar, grab someone. And we'll pray with you. And so as I bow and I pray, you come. Let's let the Lord work in our lives. You come. said many times one of my favorite things about my life is that I am absolutely nothing and I'm not worth anything but you know what Jesus is what makes us worth something amen and Jesus through my life has used a simple simple foolish young man and he's allowed me to do so much work for him and you know what I look forward to the future amen I look forward to doing more for him I look forward to leading more souls to him and I pray that you're the same way it's amazing what the Lord will do if we're just submitted to him so tonight, the charge is simple. The message is simple. Submit yourself to him. Allow him to move through your life. You see what he'll do. Keep his commandments. Amen. Keep his commandments. Get rid of all the junk. So let's do this. Let's pray, and we'll be dismissed tonight. Brother Barry, would you please pray for us as we go? Our Heavenly Father, we do come tonight thanking you for all your blessings. And Father, we do pray for our young people here. We just love you and praise you, and we ask that you be with our pastor ask that you might bless the people that are here tonight, especially those that are sick and couldn't make it. We love you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.